A few months ago, we found out that Samus from Metroid was actually supposed to be in Fortnite. It sounds like a great idea, right? Epic Games gets to bring in Nintendo fans, and Nintendo gets to expose a younger generation to one of their lesser-known older IPs. Except for the fact that Nintendo only wanted her to be visible on Nintendo Switch. And Epic Games understandably said no because how would that even work? But if you are familiar with Nintendo as a company, then these weird decisions that make no sense shouldn't really surprise you. Genuinely, I want to know if there is a single person that currently uses the Nintendo Switch app for voice chat. But one weird decision that they've always stuck with is not letting Nintendo characters appear on other consoles. A decision that many thought was out of greed, but it may have actually been out of PTSD. <laughs> Before the NES, who could possibly be here at this hour? Lamb oil, rope, bombs, you want it? It's yours, my friend. Um, no thank you, I don't take solicitors. We need you, my boy. Yep, that's what they all say. You are the chosen one. Okay, bye. Okay, anyways. Before the NES and the Famicom, Nintendo still made a lot of video games. But with no console of their own, Nintendo ported over games such as Donkey Kong to the Atari 2600, the ColecoVision, and the Intellivision. And this was one of the very first times Mario appeared on a console that was not owned by Nintendo. And for those of you typing, oh well actually, that's Jumpman, not Mario. Shut up, that's Mario, same guy. You cannot escape the fact that Mario used to laugh at animals getting hurt. And if that wasn't enough for you, the original Mario arcade game was actually ported to the Atari systems, Apple II, Amstrad CPC, and even the Commodore 64. With the release of the Famicom and the NES, Nintendo started sharing their IPs a lot less, which resulted in a lot of the games being ported being educational games such as Mario is Missing and Mario Teaches Typing. Mario Teaches Typing is a really unremarkable side-scrolling game where you make Mario punch blocks by typing keys. But where the series really shines is with Mario Teaches Typing too. Something about their noses just make me feel really uncomfortable. They're so round and fleshy, it looks more like a tumor than a nose. Dr. Mario should definitely check that out. I can't actually get this game to run and I really don't feel like setting up a virtual machine, so instead we're gonna look at some footage from the YouTube channel Nintendo Complete. Oi Rom, my favorite Nintendo game. Oh, hello! It's me, Mario! And I want to thank you for choosing Mario Teaches a Typing. I know you're gonna be a great typist. <laughs> I. I. I have no words. This sequel added a lot of features that the game didn't already have, but the star of the show is undoubtedly the disembodied Mario head. It kind of looks like a really bad Snapchat filter. Also, the lines that the disembodied Mario head says are just really strange, so here are some ones that I thought were really funny. Oh boy! Finally! I'ma get to move on the ground! Here we go! Moving on the ground, moving on the ground! <laughs> nice computer you got here! Can I have it? Look, I'm a video game! Boom! Boom, boom! Boom, boom! Boom! Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to fly for you. I'm sure that these games were fine back in the day, but with such a low frame rate, it's kind of hard to see which letters are coming onto screen. So I'm gonna say that the new gen typing games are a lot better. Shout out to my childhood typer shark. Shortly after the SNES release, the video game Mario is Missing was released on Windows and Macintosh. And this was the very first Luigi-centered game. And for those of you saying that I'm wrong, take off the fedora because I refuse to talk about Luigi's Hammer Toss game. Bowser has moved to Antarctica. Yes, that Antarctica. He is now a resident of Antarctica. And he is using portals to steal Earth's most valuable treasures so that he can sell them to buy enough hair dryers to melt Antarctica. 
Antarctica. Yes, I am serious, that is the plot of the game. It seems that this game is actually a geography game. You go to each city and find out where you are and which artifact has been stolen. Gee, I wonder where I am. This one's actually a little bit more entertaining. Mario is missing to win. What's for dinner? Oh boy! I'm so hungry, I could eat an Octorok! I'm sure you're familiar with these if you have been on YouTube for any amount of time. These games were memed to all hell on early YouTube and for good reason. Then you can help in the morning. Yes, brain rot has always existed. The CDI was a joint project between Sony and Philips. And while it was mostly just a VCR, it was most commonly known for their edutainment games. Think Leapster, but 100 times worse. During this time, Nintendo wanted to make a CD add-on for the SNES. While they were supposed to originally do it with Sony, what a weird alternate universe that would have been, they ultimately decided to do it with Philips instead. And while this attachment never saw the light of day, Philips was still contractually allowed to use Nintendo characters in their games, which resulted in some of the worst games of all time. During the CDI's run, they released four Nintendo games. Hotel Mario, Link the Faces of Evil, Zelda The Wand of Gamelon, and Zelda's Adventure. The first games to be released were released at the same time, and they were Link the Faces of Evil and Zelda The Wand of Gamelon. And with a combined budget of $1.5 million, these games were not fantastic. Link the Faces of Evil was the standard Link save Zelda plotline but it actually borrowed the 2D elements from Zelda 2: The Adventure of Link. But most famously, it used cheap, outsourced Russian animation. And for that, you have Igor Razbov to blame. With the fall of the Berlin Wall, this was the first time that an American game company outsourced animation from the country of Russia, which was only possible due to the declining political tensions. So that means that the existence of Morshu is directly correlated to the fall of the Soviet Union. Hmm. They were given only over a year to work on both games, so with a low budget and no time, these games would have never succeeded. The second one was called Zelda The Wand of Gamelon, it was the very first Zelda game to feature Zelda as the main protagonist. Take that clickbaity gaming news article, Zelda has had her own game for over 30 years! Using the same engine, this game is very similar to the first game, except this time Zelda saves Link as well as her father. The third game was called Zelda's Adventure, and to be totally honest with you, I think this one may be a little bit overhated. I know, I know, I'm not supposed to say anything positive when I'm talking about these games, but the aesthetic of this game is genuinely kind of cool. I think that the weird dark fantasy aesthetic that they're going for is actually kind of unique, and it reminds me of something like Labyrinth. And with the cheesy 90s cutscenes, it actually adds a lot of charm in a retro kind of way. Here's the problem, too many toasters. You know what they say. All toasters, toast, toast. When Nintendo partnered with Philips, they allowed them to choose any Nintendo franchise to make a game about, and that shockingly included Mario. While three Mario games were planned, only one was officially released, and it was called Hotel Mario. When you hear that title, what comes to mind? Maybe it's like a tycoon game where you help Mario start a hotel in the Mushroom Kingdom. Makes sense. No, it's actually a puzzle game where Mario goes to seven hotels and closes doors. So why did this game need to be hotel-based? And why is the main gameplay mechanic closing doors? This game was not received well and Nintendo never acknowledged its existence. Which is kind of embarrassing. That's like your parent giving you the keys to the car only for you to crash it into the nearby fireworks factory. And instead of being upset, they just kind of pretend that you don't exist anymore. The two other projects were Mario Takes America and Mario's Wacky Worlds. Surely those worlds could not be wacky. Turns out I was right. That's just Greece. This game was actually supposed to be a follow-up to Super Mario World. It was a demonstration made by Silas Warner and John Brooks, who reportedly worked 24 hours a day for weeks on one level. And when they finally showed it to Nintendo, they were actually pretty impressed. Which actually says a lot, considering that they ignored the other endeavors. And Mario Takes America was supposed to be Mario's trip to Hollywood to make a movie. And... That's it? Yup, that's it. Could these games be the reason that Nintendo doesn't loan out their IPs anymore? 
maybe, but I think what is more likely is that Nintendo realized how important exclusive games are for them. A lot of people buy Switches just to play their games, and Nintendo has shown that they aren't opposed to doing collaborations as well as letting third parties develop Nintendo games. Well, just as long as it's on their terms. I told you I'm not gonna buy anything! You are coming with us whether you like it or not. Subscribe to Gav.bull for more videos.